Okay, well, the title for the message this morning is Not a Jot or Tittle. Title is taken from Matthew 5, verse 17 through 18, as written in the King James Version. Uh, we won't be using that version for the, for the duration of the message. We're going to use the NIV translation, which reads as follows. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. But truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. May God bless the reading of his word. In the weeks to come, we'll be exploring this passage in greater detail to unpack some of the the ways in which Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets. For sure, there's, there's literally no shortage of passages where Jesus uh, fulfills Scripture, so I'll have to be selective or we'll be spending the rest of the year on that one uh, couple verses. For instance, Jesus has many titles. He is the Son of God, the Word of God, and the Lamb of God. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. Through him and in him and for him, all things were created. He is our Messiah, our Savior, our friend, as well as prophet, priest, and king. He is the resurrection and the life and the firstborn over all creation, having preeminence in over everything. He's the great shepherd and the light of the world. He's the true bread that, that comes down from heaven, and he's the gateway to eternity. He is the way, the truth, and the life, as well as the true vine that all humanity must remain in to find spiritual life and spiritual nourishment. He is this. He is these things and so much more. So as you can see, these these two verses that speak to Jesus fulfilling the law and the prophets, they're they're huge. They're huge and theologically loaded uh, and, and with tons of practical content as well. Each category, actually, of fulfillment could be a sermon series on its own right. But for today, all we are going to have time to do is really just introduce this topic, you know, just just see the tip of the iceberg above the waters and touch on a few important items in this vast sea of fulfillment. First item that I, I, I want us to grasp is what Jesus is referring to when he says the law and or the prophets. In first century Judaism, the phrase law and prophets was a means to really to point to the entirety of the Old Testament scriptures from Genesis to Malachi. So in effect, what Jesus is saying is he he has not come to abolish the Old Testament scriptures, but to fulfill them. Now, in defining the word abolish, we discover the meaning is this, to end the observance or effect of something such as a law, to completely do away with something. So that may alone come as a surprise to many of us as we may have thought, isn't that what Jesus came to do? Didn't he come to do away with the law? Didn't he come to replace the Jewish Old Testament sacrificial system? Isn't that why we have a New Testament and a new covenant today? Why do we really need to do business with with the Old Testament? It seems confusing sometimes, doesn't it? How we're supposed to navigate that water. Didn't Jeremiah write, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Hebrews 8, 7, also quoting Jeremiah 31, 31, adds this following. For, for if that first covenant had been without fault, no place would have been sought for a second. So clearly there's a certain amount of obsolescence concerning ordinances of the Sinai covenant. And while it may seem to us the Sinai covenant was abolished, Jesus speaks of it differently. He says it's not abolished, but it's fulfilled in Him. And there's a difference between the two. Further, as I mentioned before, when Jesus speaks of the law and the prophets, He's referring to all of the Old Testament, including Genesis, Exodus, and the historical books, the Psalms and Proverbs, as well as the minor and major prophets. He's really talking about that whole chunk of the Bible that comes before what we know as the New Testament and begins with Matthew's Gospel. To think of the Old Testament as completely irrelevant is actually a heresy. 
It's a heresy that was propagated by a man named Marcion, or first propagated, it's not the first time, right, by a man named Marcion during the second century. He was resolutely condemned as a heretic, for Jesus makes clear here that that's not the case. It's not the case. The Old and the New Testament remain connected and unified as God's complete and whole Word to us and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We can't just toss away the old because there's some things in there we struggle to understand or we don't like. Hopefully that's a helpful distinction. Everything prophesied about Jesus and associated with His coming, they're all, where are they found? They're all found in the law and the prophets. Without the Old Testament, we would have no background for Jesus. As our title indicates, Jesus' mention of jaw and tittle here is His way of saying every detail, every detail written in Scripture is holy and important for us to know. It's like saying A to Z, you know, or equivalent. So what is a jot? You might be wondering, what in the world is a jot? I took Hebrew in seminary. Um, I found that the Greek was a little easier because it looked like letters that I understood. To me, Hebrew was like this archaic cave scrawl, right? Um, a jot is the tenth and smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's known in Hebrew as the letter Yud. It was written above the line, and it looks much to us like an apostrophe. A, a tittle is even smaller than a jot. A tittle is a letter extension, a, a pen stroke that can differentiate one Hebrew letter from another. An example could be seen in the comparison between the Hebrew letter resh and daleth. The resh on the left is made with one smooth stroke. The daleth on the right is made with two strokes of a pen. The letters are very similar to each other, but the distinguishing mark of the daleth is the small extension of the roof of the letter. So again, this is Jesus' way of saying not even the smallest, seemingly insignificant detail of the Old Testament Scripture is going to pass away unfulfilled. Now, we might wonder why Jesus felt the need to assure His first century audience that this was the case. Perhaps it was because the Pharisees were accusing Him of non-compliance to the law of Moses. Perhaps they were, they, were, they were those loyal to the Pharisees within earshot that day of his preaching. And we know they were looking for ways to, to find ways to, 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 to put Jesus in a box and say that he, he wasn't following the law of Moses and bring him up on charges. Perhaps it was simply to assure everyone, including his own disciples, that despite the uniqueness of his teaching and his interpretation, he was not advocating for abolishing the Old Testament Scriptures. That said, that brings us to the question of how then does Jesus fulfill the law and the prophets? And again, it's a huge, huge subject, too big for me, and certainly too big for us today. The word fulfill in the original language means much the same as it does in English, so there's nothing unique there. To make full, to complete, to bring to completion, that's what it means. In Ephesians 4.10, the apostle uh, uses this same word to explain that after ascending to the heavens, Jesus fills all things. He brings to completion all things. Or upon ascending into the heavens, Jesus made all things complete. He brought all things to completion. The NIV translators took a more loftier approach in translating Ephesians 4.10 Translating it this way, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Now, in Matthew 5, 18, Jesus gives us a hint of what he had in mind concerning the law and the prophets when he says, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, or again, the jot or tittle, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. That's how Jesus phrases it, until everything in the law is and the prophets is accomplished. Here Jesus makes clear the distinction between abolishing and accomplishing the law and the prophets. He's come to accomplish what the law requires, not to abolish it or declare it irrelevant. But in this verse, and certainly in verse 20, we get a sense that there was something deeper here that, that had up to, the, up to this point 
eluded Israel. This was especially true of the scribes and the Pharisees. In addition to the original law and prophets, the scribal law was added and certainly complicated things for Jesus. If, if only the law could be kept perfectly, the scribes imagined, then God's blessing might return to Israel. So what did they do? They looked into the law and they, they took all these different principles and they tried to break them down into tangible uh, moment by moment, day by day, instruction. What started out as a well-motivated attempt to live out the law to please God eventually deteriorated into a rigid and prideful self-confidence in personal works of righteousness instead of seeking God's forgiveness and grace. So what started out well-motivated ended up way on the other side of what God ever intended. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware of this, but the scribes took the broader principles found in the law of Moses and they boiled them down to these, these minute and senseless details until it added up to 613 scribal laws. They added this to Scripture. These additional laws are known as mitzvah. Most of the difficulties Jesus ran into with the Pharisees had to do with these, these man-made regulations. Jesus clearly deemed them opposed to the grace of God. When they wouldn't let him heal on the Sabbath, for instance, he would say, you know, hey, wouldn't you, wouldn't you help your, your cow or your sheep out of a ditch, but you won't help a human being? He saw no sense in these and, and saw that they were clearly had, had taken a turn from what the Old Testament law was intended to produce in the hearts of human beings. Jesus clearly felt no duty to comply to these traditions, which made him a rebel in the eyes of the Pharisees. The people respected the scribes and the Pharisees. They were, after all, uh, the teachers of Israel. They didn't know any better. Yet at the same, same time, many were drawn to Jesus in his teaching. Crowds followed him. They may not have been able to articulate this well, but Jesus was teaching these, again, teaching the broader principles of loving God and others uh, rather than rigid law, and their souls resonated with this new teaching. He was, he, his was a message of intimacy and depth, but clearly he also felt the need to let them know that he'd not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. We'll look at these things in more detail in the weeks to come, but with our remaining time, I, I want to look at the prophetic writings and talk about how Jesus fulfilled a large number of them, a number of them, including his birth at Bethlehem. So Jesus was saying, right, he, the law and the prophets. I'm going to focus a little bit on the prophets. How many prophet, prophecies are there in the, in the Old Testament concerning the birth, life, death, and second coming of, of Jesus? Well, we don't really know. Depends on how you look at it. But most scholars believe there are more than 300. So we'll go with 300. Scholars test these prophecies on the basis of mathematical probability. In other words, the mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling even a handful of these prophecies, let alone all of them, is not only improbable, it's downright impossible. Unless he is who he says he is. And unless he does what he claims here to do to come to fulfill them. And, he's, and God can do that because nothing is impossible for God. Many people, when they think of prophecy, they have a wrong sense of how prophecy works. This is often the result of an er erroneous assumptions about God. Some think of God like a sorcerer looking into a, a crystal ball to predict the future. They might never express it that way, but many people nonetheless think of prophecy in this way. Yet God doesn't predict future events. He doesn't look into a crystal ball and predict events as if these things were somehow predetermined by fate. That's not how it works. Rather, in His sovereignty, He both wills and allows these things to come about. Prophecy is not prediction, it's a promise. It's not prediction, it's promise. Prophecy, prophecy is not visions of a future, it's foretold plans for it. Some prophecy, like Micah 5.2, that 
uh, tell us where Jesus was born are very clear, and we easily can connect them to events that we see in the New Testament. But many others are, are not so clear. Some would never have, we would never have connected at all without the Holy Spirit revealing their connection through the writers of the New Testament. Scholars have labeled the more unclear prophecies with this phrase, dark speech. If you ever read that, dark speech sounds a little bit weird. Not dark as evil, but dark as is unclear or vague. But many prophecies are, are, real, are clear, and those that are provide us with great hope. For instance, Jesus fulfills Genesis 3. He is the one who will crush the serpent's head. So we know that right from Genesis 3, when things break down and there's this tremendous fall and, and you, humanity is sliding right down the pit, right away there's a prophecy to lift us up to tell us that someday that that's going to turn around. And it will be Jesus um, who we understand that crushes the serpent's head. He is the prophet God promised Moses that he would send. In Deuteronomy, he is the King, the Lamb of God, and the Messiah. By no other name can, can we be saved. During his life, Jesus fulfilled these 300 or more prophecies, many completely outside of his control. His birth, life, death, and suffering, as well as his re resurrection, were all written anywhere from four to thousands of years before he was ever, before he ever came into this world. Clearly, we don't have time to look at all these prophecies in detail, or we'd be here more than all day. But I, I want to take a look at just a few of what I would call the most prominent, so we can grasp uh, the, the breadth and depth of how many and, and what, what we're talking about here. Concerning his ancestry, for instance, God promised Abraham the whole world would be blessed through his seed. Jesus descended from Abraham. And as the Apostle Paul explains, the seed that's mentioned was singular, and it pointed to Jesus, who was this promised blessing. God promised David, King David, his offspring would rule forever. Jesus is also descended from David. But nowhere is his fulfillment of prophecy more evident than in his betrayal, suffering, and crucifixion. There's a tremendous central focus of prophecy on that act for our benefit, for our salvation. Psalm 22, for instance, David describes his physical torment. The description matches the condition of someone who, who's being crucified some 800 years before crucifixion was ever even thought up or used. Again, in Psalm 22, David writes, dogs surround him. And the Jews often um, referred to Gentiles as dogs. Dogs surround him. They pierce his hands and feet. They put nails through his hands and feet. David also prophesied that lots would be cast to divide Jesus' clothing. John tells us it was the Roman soldiers who divided and cast lots for Jesus' clothes. The things that were being said, the insults that were being hurled at Jesus at that time were things that were written and, and, and prophesied hundreds of years before the event. You would have think that the scribes and the Pharisees who studied the law like that would have heard themselves uttering these terrible things that were prophesied uh, in the years before. David tells us false witnesses will testify against him. As we know, false witnesses did testify against Jesus at his trial before the high priest. The psalmist says his friends will abandon him. The disciples scattered and abandoned him the night he was arrested. David speaks about being betrayed by a friend. Jesus was betrayed by Judas, one of his own disciples. God told Zechariah to take the 30 pieces of silver that he earned and throw it to the potter. Judas took 30 pieces of silver and returned it to the priest who used it to buy the potter's field that Judas hung himself in. David mentioned his being fed gall and vinegar. Jesus was offered gall and vinegar on the cross. Isaiah, in chapter 50 through 53, speaks of one he calls the suffering servant who would be beaten and spit upon. And Jesus was beaten and spit upon, wasn't he? Isaiah wrote that this suffering servant would be so abused that he would barely be recognized as a human being. And Jesus was beaten, whipped, crucified, and then pierced by a spear. And as 
sad as that is, we also know by his wounds, somehow we were healed. The suffering servant would be despised and rejected by his own people. Jesus' tormentors, they rejected him and they spit in his face. The suffering servant was to bear our sins. Jesus did bear our sins. The suffering servant is like a lamb that does not defend itself. And though Jesus spoke during his trial, he never offered a defense before Pilate, did he? And while Pilate, a foreigner and a pagan, did everything he could to release Jesus because he knew that he wasn't guilty. He knew he was innocent. But the people, they shouted all the louder, crucify him, crucify him. The suffering servant was to die with the wicked. Jesus died beside two thieves. He was to be buried in the grave of a rich man. And Jesus was buried in the grave of Joseph of Arimathea one who was of the Sanhedrin that had become a believer, a rich man who offered him his his grave. The suffering servant's sacrifice would be offered for the forgiveness of sins. That's what we're all here for, right? Jesus' sacrifice offered forgiveness of all of our sins. And then there's the Christmas story, the birth of Christ foretold. God promised through the prophet um, Isaiah that a virgin would conceive. And Mary was this virgin, and she was a virgin when Jesus was conceived. God also promised to send a son who would be called, would be God with us, Emmanuel. We, 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 we talked about that today in the candle lighting, Emmanuel. Jesus is that son. The prophet Micah prophesied hundreds of years earlier that the one who would be ruler of Israel would come from Bethlehem, the town of David. And where was Jesus born? In Bethlehem, the town of David. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient of times. Sadly, the children, two years old and under, that lived in the proximity of Bethlehem were butchered by Herod. But even this horror was prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah. Every aspect of Jesus' ministry and his life were prophesied in advance of his coming. God's promised a a righteous branch from the from the line of Jesse who will do who will do justice, who will do what is just. And Jesus is that branch. God promised a great light to pierce the darkness of Israel and for the nations. And Jesus is that light. God promised someone to declare good news to the brokenhearted, the captives, and the prisoners. Well, you know what? Jesus is that someone. And in the same power and sovereignty, the Lord God Almighty will bring His peace and His governance upon this earth despite that it often looks pretty hopeless, doesn't it? Despite that it appears that evil and darkness is overwhelming the light, despite all of that, the light that has come into this world through Jesus is going to overcome the darkness. And there is nothing, no thing the darkness can do to stop it. It's already in progression. It's already fulfilled. The light will overcome the darkness. That is the hope of Christmas, isn't it? This is the hope that comes through the birth of Christ, that this process, this promise has come and it is now in process. The one who who will reign over all heaven and earth has been born into this world. He's done what he was going to do. He's fulfilled what he was supposed to fulfill. He's accomplished what he was supposed to accomplish. And folks, there's more, right? Uh, There's more that hasn't been fulfilled yet, hasn't been accomplished yet, because it's, of, it's about the future, and it hasn't come yet. We live in the place, uh, we say sometimes, in between, right? The past and the future, the now and the not yet of the truth of God. It's a promise of peace on earth, as we just sang about, right? That song that Jeff sang was kind of like, the idea of the, the song is, 
peace, we hear the bells sing, it's peace on earth, but then we look around and we say, oh my goodness, I'm not seeing that. But God is true to His Word, and that's coming. The bells will ring, and peace on earth will be established as the reign of Christ becomes visible reality for us. We're not there yet, but it's coming. That's what hope is. Hope is not like, I wish I could go on vacation. Hope is an ironclad promise that I'm banking my life on. It may not look like it will ever come, but I want you to remember this. Prophecy is not prediction. It's promise. It's promise. Our hope for a future in Christ is not a prediction like the weather that might come and go tomorrow. It's a promise. Love for God and for one another is not a prediction, it's promise. Joy is not a prediction, it's a promise. For our God is a consuming fire. And He will consume the darkness with the overcoming light of Jesus. That's our hope. Until He consumes all that stands in His way of delivering on His prophetic promises. Amen? We celebrate the advent of the birth of Christ, not only as a remembrance of Christ's birth, but also to keep alive the hope inside of us of His second coming. This is more about that actually than the past, the advent of Christ's coming. If all Scripture pointed to the one who would come and told us beforehand why and what it would look like, down to the littlest incredible detail, down to the jot and tittle even, then we should have great hope and trust that whatever, whether in our lifetimes or not, that these prophecies, these future prophecies are yet, that are yet unfilled will surely be filled in Jesus Christ. For Jesus did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but came to fulfill them until all that was written is accomplished in Him. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen.